On Two Wheels this week, Shari spends the day with the race team at Mallory Park and Wayne looks at some on-the-spot puncture repairs. Also, we'll meet some bikers all the way from New Zealand. I'm here at Mallory Park on this extremely windy, albeit dry, day. Today I'm here to check out what's going on with our British Superbike and 600 Supersport riders. There's a couple of teams here today checking out the tyres, the suspension and everything else they do when they're testing. Anyway, I'm going to find out exactly what goes on, even though they do tend to be a little secretive. So let's see what we can find out. See you, Mike. Neil, ex-World Superbike rider, now British. Bit of a sidestep, you'd say. What brought that on? Uh, well, I had um, three, season in the world, three seasons in the World Superbikes, and um, I had a bit a mixed, mixed three seasons. I had some good, good performances and some bad performances, and um, I think, unfortunately, I had too many bad performances, so uh, I, I wasn't able to secure a factory ride. And um, the opportunity came up to ride for the GSE Ducati team, and basically, to cut a long story short, I took the deal, you know, and I uh, feel confident that the bikes uh, that we're going to be racing on are going to be the best bikes out there. And what I've seen of the team so far, which is not a lot, but what I've seen, they seem very, very professional. So I'm, uh, I'm concentrating on this year. I'm not going to, I don't want to talk about the, the bad results of years gone. I want to talk about what I'm going to do for the future and hopefully stay with GSE. Well, that's fair enough, but you're, you've had good results in the past anyway, you know, GP, 1-5 to five winner and 500s. But um, now you're on this uh, Ducati V-Twin compared to the four-cylinder bike last year. Are you a V-Twin person? Uh, well, it's funny because this is the first outing I've had on the bike and um, it's, it's taken some learning again that, you know, I've not ridden a Ducati now since the end of 97, so a couple of years has gone by. And... Um, feels different you know you get used to what you what you're riding and uh, having spent a season on a big four cylinder and a big wide bike you get on the small narrow slim Ducati with a different power characteristics and it, and it feels different you know but I'd have to be uh, truthful and say I'm I'm already feeling at uh, one with the bike you know the first two or three outings I thought I've forgotten what a Ducati felt like but now I've done you know I've probably done 60 70 laps I'm starting to feel like the bike's part of me which is the feeling that you want well, we're here, you're here today testing, and it's just really to get the adjustments right on the bike, the foot rests, and, but there's not else, else you can do because actually this isn't the bike you're going to be racing this year, is it? Yeah. No, no, it's, um, this is basically what they used last year, but um, the Ducati frame is a Ducati frame, and uh, you know, I can still have valid testing by making sure that, you know, just the general riding position, it's a lot to, to get it's difficult to get the right feeling from a bike and uh, sometimes it's just small adjustments with the footrests and handlebars that make the difference between you feeling comfortable or uncomfortable so you know I'm, I'm not really worried about what lap times I'm doing today I'm just messing around and trying to feel comfortable on the bike. Because the bike you're racing this year is actually um, Carl Fogarty what he was racing last year so that's um, quite a mean talky V-twin. Yeah. Do you find that um, the talk of the V-twins is beneficial to the tracks in England? Yeah, because um, there's a lot of tight and twisty circuits and uh, on a four-cylinder you have to do a lot of gear changes. Where on the Ducati you can stay in one gear and just use the torque of the engine and it saves on gear changes, which eventually uh, you'll end up saving on your, you know, your lap time will be faster. Well, I want you to take me around the track later and um, let me know what sort of speed you're actually doing, you know, the straights and just to get a feel of exactly how manic it is out there. No problem at all, it would be my pleasure. Carl Harris, ex what motocross rider I believe. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what do you do there then? Um, motocross. Yeah. What, do you, what results did you get? All oh, right. Um, well, in the eight cc, I was British champion, and I won every race outright in the year, and then um, also in the hundred cc, and then third in the one two five British British one two fives as well. So now you got into road racing <coughs> on the six hundreds, and you're here testing at Mallory. Um, what brought you into the road racing scene? Um, well, it was Ron Aslam, of all people, who um, brought me into it, because I used to do motocross and that before, and then we decided to go road racing, and then Ron was decided to run a team with the British 125 super teams, so I thought I'd um, ask Ron if he'd have a rider available for me, and that's how I got onto it, and ever since then I've just carried on. So what did you come last year? Pardon? 
What did you come last year? Oh, in last 600s? year in the 600s, um, I finished 10th overall in the British Championship, which was not a bad year because it was my first year in 600s and stuff like that. And I had a few good results, like seconds and fifths and stuff like that. But yeah, it was good. I know the 600s is a very, very competitive race, and you're actually racing at Suzuki. Yeah, this Suzuki year? this year. Yeah, with um, GR Motorsport. And to anybody who's thinking why we're sat in the back of the van and why he's not on the bike, um, well, perhaps you should explain this. <laughs> um, well, I'm coming out the S's at Mallory and um, the bike ended up blowing up, so I'm not very happy at the moment. So sometimes practices are cut short, um, but this is what it's all about, getting to know the bike, and if they blow up, they blow up, we pack them up and go home. Well, till next practice then. That's right, yeah, hopefully we'll go off to Spain in the next week or so. so get off there and get some proper tyre testing done because that's what we're supposed to be doing today, tyre testing. Unfortunately, it's been cut short. Right, team consists of riders, the mechanics busily working behind us and also a manager. Whose role is exactly what, Colin? Well, there's team manager, obviously, uh, many responsibilities. Um, looking after, well, basically writing up contracts, negotiating with riders, uh, manic, <laughs> managers, mechanics, um, making sure we've got all the suppliers, sponsors and everything sorted. Um, this off-season is the busiest time for me. And come the season when it started, hopefully if I've done everything correctly, it's uh, quite a routine job. But isn't that surely when you're like um, pushing the riders, trying to get them to perform as much as you would like them to? Not at this level, no. I mean, the riders uh, know what's expected of them. It's not written in the contracts, the performance, what's expected of them, they know. Um, they're professionals, they need to be at peak, peak fitness, get the best results they can. Obviously, they, um, they're out, all out to do that. OK, so Neil, he seems like he's not too bothered about what you get up out there, you know, he doesn't, he's not on your back, but I know when you've got a big team behind you like this, there's a lot of responsibility, whereas if you're a privateer. So, I mean, how does that feel? Um, well, don't let Colin uh, kid you. If I get poor results, he'll be the first person to be jumping on my back. But what, he, what he's saying is, you know, we know, I know exactly what what results Neil Hodgson should get. So, um, if if I finish fourth, fifth, I'll be disappointed. You know, I'm planning on being in the top three in every race. So, um, there's not there's pressures every time you go out on a motorcycle. The pressure that I put myself under. Um, at a test like this is. The team won't put me under any pressure. It's just a case of being uh, familiarised, like I said, with the bike. So, but I always put myself under pressure because I want to. I know what I'm capable of doing. So, as far as like psyching yourself up, I mean, you know, a lot of that's to do with racing. Do you sort of sometimes can you like win a race in your head, or can you actually lose a race before you even started, depending how you feel? Yeah, so so they say. Um, like I say today, I'm not psyching myself up because there's no there's nothing to get excited about. It's just a case of getting familiarised, but. Come race day, you've got to be mentally and physically at your peak, you know, the best the best you could possibly be, and uh, I'm sure I will be for the first race. Well, they've obviously all got to get on here, and uh, have you met Troy before? Because this is the first practice, so you're new team manager. Mm -hmm. So, I um, mean, how do you all get on? You know, how are you sort of you're competing not... against each other? And... Well, course, yeah, we'll be competing against each other, but uh, you, don't, you don't have to be enemies. You know, if you can get on with your teammate and you can work together, as a team, we can we can uh, we can do twice as much work testing. So, my plan is I mean I've I've heard many things about um, Troy. Everybody said he's a laid back Australian. You know he's he's very friendly. So, I'm pretty laid back myself. So I'm sure we'll get on and uh, hopefully we'll we'll have a good relationship. And when the light turns to green, the the best man will win on the day. Uh, Troy is pretty laid back. He's a really nice guy. But I believe you know you've had quite a few teammates, Kaczynski, and um, was Gobert your teammate, or was this just something else I heard what happened? I mean, I know sometimes you can have problems. Yeah, Gobert's not my teammate. I don't like talking about Gobert. Uh, Fogarty was my teammate. I don't like talking about Fogarty. <laughs> and I certainly don't like talking about Kaczynski, so uh, let's talk about Troy Bayless. He's going to be a good, he's gonna be a good teammate, I'm sure. James Hayden, he's seventh last year in the British Superbike Series. Well, seventh isn't brilliant but then it isn't bad I mean what do you intend for this year um, well, yeah I mean we, we were unlucky we were in the top three and top four of the championship for most of the year but we had um, an injury which put us out for two meetings which was four races and uh, you know it dropped us well down the list but yeah I mean I wasn't unhappy we we've got a really good bike and good setup this year and uh, you know we've got good sponsors Suzuki put a lot of money in Sony 
and uh, you know we've got we've got the package. So yeah, I mean I think we'll be a, a title contender. That's the trouble. People think oh seventh whatever, but they don't realise everything that goes into it because you miss a round, you miss vital points. But at least as you're saying this year, you've got um, the bike which you're familiar with, so that actually puts you um, ahead by some ways. I mean, I mean, is there any difference to this bike this year, or is it more or less the same as last year? No, it's actually completely different. It's the same. It's still a Suzuki, but it's um, a full factory bike, so it's sort of hand built, handmade in uh, in Japan, and a lot more expensive. You know, it's sort of like two hundred thousand pounds for one. So you know, there are. You know, as as four stroke racing goes, you know, they're as good as you can get. So, you know, it's a, it's a hell of a package though. Your bike, four cylinder, it has actually got twin injectors on each cylinder. Uh, yeah, it has indeed. And uh, yeah, that's really what we're, we're sort of they're mapping out here on the computers is like, you know, how much fuel it's like squirting in at what sort of time. So, you know, to simplify it madly. Um, but, you know, that's kind of, you know, basically what's what. Plus, we're trying, you know, new suspension parts, new linkages, the ratios. You know, in in the linkages themselves. So there's so much stuff we're trying, but you know, a lot of it's top secret. So I can't tell you. I just won't tell you anything. Saw you on the track earlier. It looked brilliant. I mean, you know, going into the hairpin, breaking right the last minute. I mean, what what's your like average speed around the track, and what's your best lap time? Um, you know, we've been doing sort of low. You know, with 49.1, I think we did in that last session. So it's not. You know, it's about a second and a bit off the lap record, but. You know, when you, by the time you put qualifiers on and a nice day, you're there. But for like a cold day in February, you know, it's it's and a very very windy going to Gerald's as well. It's it's not too bad. So what lap time did you do? I missed that. Uh, 49.1. So um, you know, and the lap record I think is a 47.6 or something. Um, and I did a 48.1 here last year on race tyres. So that's about as quick as you go on normal tyres. But you can take that off when you put hot, ultra sticky qualifying tyres, but they only last a couple of laps, so you know, there's no point in doing that on a day like today when we're testing a lot of stuff. Um, but man, it's quite a fast, it's, you know, it's a little so it's got the slow section in the bus stop, but Gerrard's, I think we exit at something like 130, 140 mile an hour on the way out. Um, but it's not, you know, I think, I don't know, 150, 160 mile an hour around here, so it's not mega quick, but it's, you know, it's not slow. So um, what are you going around Gerrard's Bend? What? Um, it's full skier, it's fifth just on the way out, so yeah, I mean, I'd say you're exiting, you're sort of banked over, I don't know, 130, 140, yeah, coming out, you know, easy, I'd say. Right, now we're actually heading onto the track, we're actually taking a tour of the track, but I want to hear what's actually going through your head when you're going around these corners. Well, this, this corner's a, a really, really fast corner, Gerard's, and you approach this in, um, you, you're in sixth gear, then you go down to uh, fifth gear, and I always try and keep a really tight line around this corner because if you go wide, if you go over there, then the camber of the road is, is a negative camber. So it's quite dangerous there. Right. You're coming into a tricky section now, the hairpin. You go all the way from fourth gear down to first gear, and it, this, is a, this is a very, very tight corner. The, it's the tightest corner You'll go around everyone on a racing circuit, it is really tight. I remember I went round it once and I almost flipped myself off with my foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then this next section is called the bus stop. It's a very tricky, tricky section. It's called the bus stop because it's like a bus stop. Then hard on the gas. First gear, second gear, third gear. Oh, I changed gear the wrong way then. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Hey, so how fast you go down here then? Well, you can probably get up to about 150 miles an hour, 160 miles an hour. Well, it's been an interesting day, windy day, and I think a lot of the riders have got what they wanted out of it. Tyres testing, me on the back, Neil Hodgson riding a pan-European. Wow, God, I hate being pillion though. The mechanics work ever so hard. The riders go out, try them out, they come back in, they make more adjustments. That's how it is, it's all trial and error. Well, let's hope that something good comes out of it anyway. After the break, Wayne looks at some on-the-spot puncture repairs and we'll meet the Flying Kiwis. <laughs> Bikers and charity are two words that definitely go together. Every year, thousands of us join forces to deliver presents to local children's hospitals and homes. And during the winter, thousands more brave the elements to deliver gifts to local charities. But on a recent trip to one of my local dealers, I came across some guys who travel literally from the other side of the world 
to do their bit for charity. We've come 13,000 miles all the way from New Zealand to promote the reliability of the new Yamaha R6 model that's just been released onto the market straight out of the crate. We're going to be racing the bike, 10 of them with 10 New Zealand races, at the Donington Endurance Meeting on the 3rd of May, the Coca-Cola International Northwest 200 on the 11th to the 15th of May, and then we're going to be doing the Isle of Man Junior TT. One of the other major issues that we have at the moment is to raise funds for the Clear House Children's Hospital. What we're hoping to do is raise as many funds as we can during the tour to promote the Clear House Hospital and raise funds for the terminally ill children. One of the major problems that we do have at this stage though is sponsorship funding because it takes money to make money and although we would like to run the race team as professionally as we can so that we can promote ourselves in a professional manner, if we can do that then we can raise more money for the children's hospital. My name is Brett Martin. I'm from New Zealand. I'm over here with the Flying Kiwis on their Three Nation Tour, road race tour of the UK. I'm their race technician and performance engineer for the R6. Uh, we feel that the bike is the top production bike of the year and we're not looking at having any major problems with it this year except tyres, brake pads and motor oil. Otherwise, I think I could be out of a job this season. <laughs> Charity and fundraising side of it is very important but that doesn't mean to say we're going to take the riding any less seriously. Um, I've competed at the Isle of Man last year and so I'll be a, one of the senior members there helping the other guys out with course knowledge and whatever, what have you. Um, Donington Park shouldn't be a problem as it's just a short circuit, it won't be hard to learn that. The Coca-Cola Northwest 200 is a top venue, I went over there with Billy Nutt Promotions on an exercise to have a look at the track and what have you and it was very good. Great team coming here, We're all mates, can't wait to get started and looking forward to the first practice session at Donington Park. We've recently purchased a 40 foot coach that we're in the process of converting into the team transporter and uh, that will be used to promote the team and have all the sponsorship logos and so on all, all plastered around the side of it <coughs> along with our web page that we have. Uh, we're sort of roughing it at the moment, we're sort of sleeping in that and, and preparing the bikes during the day so we're sure it's all going to come together at the end. And we'll be following the exploits of the Flying Kiwis here on Two Wheels. I don't believe it. I'm going to blinking punch you. So what on earth do you do on these occasions when you're stuck in the middle of absolutely nowhere and you've got a flaming puncture? Well, I suppose you try and muster a bit of help. I don't suppose any of you lads could uh, help us, eh? No response. Then I suppose you could always magic a bit of help. Abracadabra. And voila! A small selection of products that should and may help you get you out of trouble. There is in fact preventatives as well as cures, such as these two. PJ1's flat shield, and slime, yeah, tyre sealant. What on, earth, what on earth are those, you might ask yourself? Well, they are exactly what they say they are. They are indeed tyre sealants. The idea is you stick those into your tyres before the day arises, you get a puncture, and hopefully, if you do get a hole in your tyre, they'll fill the hole up, just enough to get you home or to the garage or wherever you're gonna go to get it fixed correctly. But what if you haven't used the preventative? Well then, you need a repair kit, and that's where these come into the equation. Here's one, 
very nicely packaged with big handles and it goes in a little bag of its own. It has got the necessary plugs and the necessary tools to ream a hole into the tyre. This is tubeless, of course. And in doing that, you then bung a plug into it with the necessary solutions and you reinflate the tyre. And they do give you some air canisters with especially a unique device to help blow the tyre up. It's a possibility that that might work, but then again, there's many a folk out there who are very feared of using anything that's a little high tech. So you might be hesitant to use it. It's not the only product that's available of similarities. Here's another one. And that again has got the canisters and in that little package will have the appropriate device and including that will in fact be the, the, the necessary plugs to plug the hole. You can buy things like that, which was from Tip Top and this particular one from High Level. And you can buy both of those for around 20 pounds. There is a little cheaper one here, which is a self vulcanizing kit with all the necessary bits and pieces in, even a knife to cut your wrist if you're having trouble. And that you can buy for 12 quid. Your sealants will cost you around a fiver upwards, depending on how big the tire is. You'll need a lot of sealant for a big one, and a little bit of sealant for a little one. But the fact about it is you still need to inflate. Now we spoke about these little devices that do in fact inflate, but you could always carry this, the luxury of a pump. A rechargeable pump. That's what I'll do. I shall try and pump it up with this. If it is a genuine puncher, then I'm snookered. The only thing for it is to get the good old mobile phone out, ring somebody up, get the bike collected, and I'll get a lift home. So I'll show you how the professionals repair it. But for that, we'll have to wait until next week. Also coming up next week on Two Wheels, a ride on CCM's 604E Sport, their Supermoto.